everyone, good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar, Are You Fit to Grow? 10 Criteria to a Fit Business. I'm really excited to be your host today. My name is Michelle Lettman and I also have Steve here who will be helping us out by answering any of your questions throughout the webinar. Speaking of questions, if you have any questions for Mark during the presentation, you can communicate with us using the question box, which is in the webinar control panel on the right hand side of your screen. Why don't you go ahead and see if you can locate that right now and let us know where you're joining us from today. Today we have Mark Richardson, leading authority in the remodeling industry and author of three books, which you'll have a chance to request during the webinar at the end. Uh, he has a wonderful presentation for you all today. So sit back, relax, and Mark, you can take it away. Great, thank you, Michelle, and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, if you're on the East Coast, this is late in the day and probably a little later than normally do and taking a little business fitness checkup. But I'll try to make this seminar or webinar and fitness checkup as enjoyable as, as possible. Um, unlike a lot of webinars that I do, this one is going to be about half kind of presentation of different kinds of things and about half interactive in the sense that you're going to have a little bit of an assignment and that's doing a business fitness checkup. So the structure of what we're going to do today is I'm going to spend the first probably five or ten minutes talking a little bit about the environment, the remodeling, the construction, the home improvement environment, the kind of stars and planets out there to help kind of you create a little bit more context about kind of the industry. Then I'm going to focus on some of the keys to success. I, I've been fortunate in having been involved in this industry for about 40 years that I not only have kind of been there, done it in terms of growing a very successful business, but also I get a chance to work with some of the best of the best. So I'm going to summarize those, kind of put them in a big pot and boil them down and talk to you a little bit about some of the key sets. Um, then we're going to take a very quick break, just enough for uh, my friends here at Surefire to offer you some uh, of my books or prizes, that kind of thing. And then I'll dive back in and we're going to actually do a fitness checkup. And that fitness checkup is going to be, you know, kind of like going to the doctor and having your cholesterol and blood pressure checked. However, I won't be poking you and it's a little bit more subjective. So it's not anything you need to be nervous about in terms of us doing. Uh, I'll, when we get to that portion of the webinar, I'll give you more of the kind of the lay of the land and how we're going to do it. But let me, let me just start with the business environment that's out there. I think anyone that's been involved in the remodeling industry has seen a lot of change, change in terms of different cycles in the remodeling business and certainly the homeowner environment that's out there. And what I really encourage people to do is kind of sit back and look at this environment and try to break it in terms of some of the parts. Some of my work and our work at Harvard, we look at some of the key indicators and there's something called a LIRA, Leading Indicator Remodeling Activity, that you know extracts about seven or eight different criteria what's happening out there. And I'm going to do a little bit more of a layman's version, not an economist version of what that is about. So let's just start with one of them and that's home appreciation. Home appreciation for the most part continues to remain relatively strong. Now we're seeing a little bit of softening in some of the markets, we're seeing a little bit of softening in some of the price points, but for the most part we're not seeing home appreciation kind of depreciate or drop off like certainly we did after the crash in 2008. Matter of fact, in 2011, we only had about two or three of the top 25 markets that were appreciating where in 2013, 2014, 24 of the top 25 markets were, were appreciating. So we, we continue to see what I would consider solid level of appreciation. Certainly not going up double digit where it becomes a little bit of a frenzy, but we do continue to see positive things. Interest rates. Interest rates uh, continue to be relatively low. Now, I know that we've gotten a little bit spoiled by having low interest rates and we see, you know, it go up a quarter point or half a point here and there for interest rates and all of a sudden kind of the sky is falling. But I oftentimes remind audiences who I'm speaking to, you know, I bought my first home in 1981 and I actually paid in terms of interest rate for and a half percent so when we're looking at interest rates today you know they're still relatively low and what's happening with this little bit of an uptick in interest rates those 
financially savvy homeowners out there, it is actually creating a little bit more urgency on their part to get going on remodeling projects. So for the most part, that rem remains pretty strong. Unemployment, unemployment, obviously, we know it's a labor market. We know that unemployment rates are very, very low. And what, what's interesting is when you combine low unemployment and good home appreciation, it almost is an exponential effect in terms of positive environment for the remodeling industry. Another that oftentimes people don't think about, especially remodelers, is kind of the level of new home or new housing demand. You know, the demand that's out there for housing is much greater than our ability or the production or custom builder's ability to produce it. So that's creating a little bit of a gap. It's a gap that obviously is problematic for those who want a new home. However, it can be pretty positive for home improvement because people are really forced to say, you know, rather than going with this new home, uh, what I need to do is kind of fix up what I've got. You know, the stock market. And we've seen in the last period of months, certainly some perky jerkiness in many, many levels. But for the most part, you know, the stock market from the crash to the present, I mean, it's gone up several hundred percent in that period of time. And it's created, I think, kind of a little bit of a wealth effect that we oftentimes see out there. All these things combined, I think, uh, have the biggest effect, and that's to create confidence. Now, obviously, when there's certain things going on, either politically or certain things going on globally, we get a little bit nervous. But for the most part, when we kind of take a look at a snapshot, the overall consumer confidence out there continues to be relatively strong. So as a result of all this, you know, I think you really have to think. You have to think and ask yourself the question, you know, based on all these stars and planets, based on all these real indicators, not feelings, but real indicators, you know, is it really a good time to grow or is it a good time to hunker down? You know, oftentimes I'll use metaphors and analogies, and we know when we're driving a car, we certainly don't want to slam on the accelerator, but at the same time, we know we don't want to be riding the brake at the same time. So I would argue, while you may not be wanting to, you know, grow at very aggressive rates right now, do in fact need to think in terms of growth and not necessarily hunkering down. So as you understand, I think a little bit more of your business and what's happening in the environment, I think one of the key indicators that's out there, a key kind of ways to look at it, is this simple little graphic that shows business cycle. Now, many years ago, those involved, especially those from Harvard and others, kind of that were studying the home improvement industry and comparing to new construction, there was really a belief that the new construction and home remodeling were counter-cyclical. But the reality is the cycles are very much the same. However, the peaks and valleys are what varies. So new construction obviously dropped off dramatically in 2008. And in 2008, it dropped off like 75%. Larger scale remodeling 2008-2009 dropped off dramatically as well. Most of the better big design build firms, it dropped off 30-40%. Kitchen and bath also dropped off, softened a little bit. And even specialty, while it didn't drop off that much in some of those difficult times, it still softened a little bit. And then home maintenance and those kind of things and handyman services was a little bit more level. The important thing with this is that all remodeling is not created equal. So as you really are thinking about your business and you're comparing it to other industries, you know, what you have to do is you have to take into account, I think, some of the differences. So let's meet, let me talk to you a little bit about some of the differences between remodelers. As I said, they're not all the same and they're not all divided just because of the product that they do. So some of the key business differences that are out there, and you can kind of look at this and try to understand kind of like jigsaw puzzle, how do we fit into kind of this, this community of remodelers out there? One is the difference in the client demographic. You know, some remodelers are targeting very high end, upper middle, middle, or even low end in terms of what they're doing. So the client demographic might change. Another is specialty versus full service remodeler. While the dialect, the remodeling is, is pretty much the same, you're still doing work on the home, the dialect or the language and the processes really are quite different. Showrooms versus in-home sales. Matter of fact, this is something that's changing dramatically and at the Extreme Sales Summit coming up in Philadelphia in September, there's gonna be a lot of focus on how sales is changing and innovative 
selling process. You know, do you subcontract or do you have labor internally? That's a fundamental difference between businesses. Also size and types of projects vary. Lead generation methods, whether it's having a very robust marketing strategy, whether it's leveraging a lot of the digital marketing activity or whether you're still dependent on word of mouth. You know, one of the interesting things at a recent conference that Google actually presented in terms of market research, they said that today more than 50 50% of the homeowners put more value, more value on an online review than they do a personal referral. If you really start to think about that, that's dramatically different for most remodeling business. Another difference is, is financing. Who's providing the finance? Specialty community depends on financing and full service community, quite frankly, design build firms, they don't even want to get involved in financing and it's really a little bit more of a challenge. Another big difference is the sales process itself. You know, how many sits? And what we're seeing also in the industry is this sales process is getting more and more elongated and as a result causing, I think, a level of stress that's a little bit more challenging. But one of the other big, big differences that I want to spend a little time talking about is the motivation of the owner themselves. And, you know, I thought for many years, all remodelers kind of cared about the same thing, but the re reality is one of the fundamental differences, before we talk about growth and growth strategies and how to think about these things, you gotta look at the motivations of the owner themselves. So I've actually written about, and we've done podcasts on this subject of talking about the seven motivations of owners out there, seven motivations of leaders, and I wanna unpack those for you. Now, needless to say, most of us are not mechanical, we're not just falling into one bucket, that we're a blend of usually two or three of these things, but what I do find when I've done this kind of test is I've worked with different remodeling owners and leaders that you oftentimes are kind of a blend of these. And what you need to do is you need to look in the mirror, understand yourself, not just assume that either someone giving you a speech on a subject or another remodeler is really how you should structure your business. So the first motivation I see out there is some remodelers, especially the smaller type remodelers, very respectable, hardworking people, they're just happy to have a job. Probably lost a job and then they went and started to do a little bit of remodeling on their own and before they knew it, they had a remodeling business. It's kind of like stepping into the quicksand and before they knew it, it was up to their waist and they looked to their spouse and said, you know, we're in the remodeling business. They're just happy to have a job. It's not about growth, not about market share. It's not about anything other than to show up every day and be able to control their own destiny. Another motivation I see a lot with with remodeling owners is, is what I call more the entrepreneur. The entrepreneur is the one that's out there that's really focus on innovation, new ways of doing. Oftentimes the entrepreneur out there is taking levels of risks that are much greater and they're quite comfortable that that risk creates fulfillment and interest. For them. You know, another motivator of some businesses, and this is not many remodeling businesses, they look at it more like an investment. I actually have a friend out in California who very much looks at his business, fairly good sized business, as an investment. And he looks at the returns on his investment, not just profitability, he looks at each one of his team members in terms of what the returns are in terms of profitability of each team member and makes his decisions accordingly. It's almost like rental property. What's the return on it? So again, it's not to judge, but if you in fact are focused on this, then obviously how you go about approaching your business is a little different. The fourth motivation, which really is kind of where my roots are coming from, and that is it's the motivation of creating a great and healthy business. A business has a life of its own. A business is the pace. You might have leadership or ownership in the business, but you also have team members and you have products and you have services. It's so it, the business motivation, the health of the business and the growth of the business is really what you care about. Another motivation, I, and I don't see this necessarily with a lot, but I do see this with some, that the motivation is more about the ego. It's the ego of being on the cover of a magazine or winning an award that is actually more, more important than the fundamental profitability of the business. And again, I'm not here to judge what your motivation is, but at least acknowledge if that's part of your motivation and you want to be kind of a maven from a public relations point of view, then how you think about structuring and moving your business forward, I think is 
important. Another motivator that I see out there, and I see this more and more with some of the better remodelers, is that a big part of the motivation is some cause. Cause is something bigger than you. It's bigger than the business. It could be a cause focused on the environment. It could be a cause focused on aging in place or something that's relative to a cause in a community. This is not just a marketing effort. This is what you fundamentally is your core purpose and what you care about. And then a big, big motivator that I see out there, probably as much as any, is the legacy. And that's the legacy of the family, of the team members of the future. Matter of fact, if you think about multi-generational businesses, in many cases, founders of those businesses care more about their family and the future and the well-being of their family than they necessarily do for the clients or the products or the services. So again, the legacy of the business becomes the most important. Now, as I said, the way I would look at all of this is you're listening to this podcast and or webinar uh, is think about the blend of who you are, but make this also a little bit of a discussion point of your leadership. You know, what are we really motivated and try to use these seven. And if there are even one or two others, feel free to discuss those. But if you don't know why and you don't know the motivation, then it's very hard to have a very clear path of where you're heading. So let me just talk for a minute about defining growth. You know, we talk about growth all the time, but the reality is how you define growth should be filtered through number one, your motivation, and then certainly how you define growth is not right or wrong, but it is important that everyone is defining growth in a similar way. So here's a few ways to define growth. Top line sales is fairly classic. You know, last year you did five million, this year you're gonna do six million. That obviously is a a top line growth kind of model. Another one that is not necessarily uh, as important in, in remodeling, but it is important in many businesses in market share. In, in remodeling, most remodelers have a very small market share. So that's not necessarily one, but it is important. And if that is important to you, then it's certainly how you approach your strategies um, are, are also something to think about. Another way to grow is your portfolio blend. In the portfolio may be types of projects, maybe types of clients, might be big and small projects, might be size of projects. So really looking at the blend of what it is and you want to create growth as a result of that portfolio blend. Another growth, growth I think, direction is certainly and very important now more than ever is growing the team. Growing the team, not only in terms of keeping them, but also not having them leave. Another growth element to track is profitability. A lot of times I will talk to remodelers that care really mostly about profit, profitability and not the other things, but I would argue profitability, as we'll talk about in the fitness checkup, is just one of the elements. Predictable and sustainable results. You know, the reality is remodeling businesses, they go up and down based on the times, but all, always they, they also go up and down based on, on the business model itself. Strategic alliances is another way to look at the growth. You know, I think now more than ever, we're seeing a lot more partnerships with manufacturers and distribution and remodelers that are kind of working together, and that might be another way to define growth. But the most important question, I think, is for you and certainly your leadership team, how do you define growth? And I think once you understand, I think, a little bit more about the environment, understand a little bit more about how you are looking at your motivations, then I think you can start to articulate the growth. So let's talk about some ideal growth rates. One of the common questions I oftentimes get from owners is what is the right cadence? What is the right growth rate for a company out there today? And we are in what I would consider normalized time. You know, we're not in a time that we're kind of digging out of a recession. If anything, we're, we're looking more forward and probably in the next two or three years, we'll see some pretty major soft. So thinking about your growth rate, I think it's kind of like thinking about like a runner. You know, am I a 5K runner, 10K or a marathon runner? You know, what is my average speed? What's my average growth rate? What's my average heart rate in terms of what I want to do? So I'm going to give you some just guidelines on this and what I'm finding from other remodeling businesses that are out there that might be of interest. So zero to 5% annualized growth in terms of top line growth. That's what I'm speaking to now, top line sales. You might actually be slipping or losing a little bit of market share, or maybe the competition is gaining some ground, a little bit higher market share than you have. Five to 10% is fine. 
it's it's respectable. A uh, little bit of uh, less, little less team opportunities, uh, and probably not a whole lot of change and improvement and innovation in the business. In my opinion, the sweet spot for growth of business in normalized times is about 10 to 20 percent uh, top line growth. Now, for some of you, this may seem crazy, it may seem too aggressive, but I think it's ideal. It's ideal because it really has a strong profit potential. You can continue to see good profit with a 10, 20% level of growth, but also you can see really, really good team retention. You know, one of the key things you have to ask yourself is why do people stay with you? And I would argue that people are going to stay with you more if they see opportunities for growth than just having a job. 20 to 30% is really starting to get pretty aggressive. You may slip in terms of some of your efficiencies and effectiveness. You might even see some profitability slip, some gross profit kind of uh, slipping down to lower points. And you also might see a much higher degree of team stress. And that stress can result in kind of negative uh, influence over time. Once you get above 30% annualized growth and higher, and there's a bunch of companies that are in this, this is just very, very aggressive. And as I coach and I work with different businesses, I'm not necessarily here to judge you should or shouldn't, but there are very few companies that can have that kind of level of sustainable growth and do it successfully and quite frankly maybe even stay in business so it is a little bit more risky the more appropriate question is go back the last three years in these kind of normalized times where is your level of growth where's your targeted growth through 2018 as we look in the 19 what do you, what should you be targeting and if you've got a fairly healthy fit business then I would say try to work towards at least play out models towards that 20 10 to 20 percent growth. If you have a lot to fix in your business, maybe you want to push it down in 2018-2019 at 0 to 10 percent, get it fixed, and then put the accelerator down a little bit more. So let me just talk about a few keys to success, and then we'll take just a quick break and we'll do this fitness checkup. There's really three keys to success that I see out there with the best of the best. The first is you have to have the right mindset. You know, I love this little quote from Henry Ford. If you think you can or can't, uh, you're right. You know, it all starts with having the right mindset. Mindset is about having the positive attitude. You know, a friend of mine from Detroit during the recession, you know, in an acceptance speech, he said, you know, we're from Detroit. All the other businesses out there slipped double digit. We grew double digit. We just chose not to participate in the recession. You know, having that mindset and that positive attitude has a lot to do with winning or losing. So that's a big part of it. Another is realizing it's tough out there. You know, Greg Lamont Mon said, you know, it's not easy. It only gets fast. And I think when it comes to work ethic, it really ties into that. It's not easy out there. It takes a high level of work ethic today to be successful. It's also more of a team sport than ever before. You know, I think as a result of that, you need to leverage your relationships with digital marketing groups like Surefire or manufacturers. Uh, and, and distributors in your area, as well as you members of your team with production and sales kind of working together. The second element I think that you have to think about for the fit businesses out there, and certainly for the successful ones in terms of keys to success, is change. You know, I love this little adage, you know, if you're not changing, you, you become irrelevant. You know, and becoming irrelevant is probably the ultimate insult. Insult certainly to the business, to your clients, to certainly the product, but also it's an insult to your team. It's an insult to your family. It's an insult to yourself. So as you think about this, try to compare, you know, 10 years ago versus today in terms of your client, your marketing efforts, and your sales. And this little chart, I think, just helps you understand. You know, back right before the recession, you know, there was a mindset of just do it. You know, today, let's just discuss it. There's a lot more grinding through and discussing things with clients, not just doing it. You know, there was a lot more willingness in 2007 and 2006 to take a lot more risk, where I think today people really want to balance their level of risk. They're looking for sensible and uh, smart things and ways to do stuff. Ten years ago, the clients would find you, where today, 
you need to have a marketing strategy and strategy to get out and find the right clients for your business. Ten years ago, technology was optional, where today, technology is not optional. It's an integral part of your business. As a matter of fact, we used to say, technology will revolutionize this industry. Now we say it has revolutionized this industry, and you certainly know it. Ten years ago, your clients, 10, 15 years ago, would follow the fantasy because they were seeing high levels of appreciation. They just follow all their ideas and fantasy. Today, it's up to you as a remodeler to control that fantasy, to really give them the right strategies and what to do with their remodeling. In the past, you could focus on the what, the product. Today, you need to focus also on the how. How clients go about doing the remodeling. The process, sales process, interactive process, leveraging technologies today as much as ever. So. If you're not operating on the right side of that equation right now, you probably need to take a look at the level of change that you need to integrate into your business. So we're going to take a break in a moment here. And when I come back, I'm going to talk about this whole notion of business fitness. And as I said at the, at the beginning, we're going to take you through a fitness checkup. So you're going to need a pencil or a pen and a piece of paper, just a blank piece of paper. And what I'm going to do is I'll walk you through a fitness checkup of how to look at 10 different criteria within your business. And then at the end of this, we're going to score it. And then I'm going to take a few minutes and talk about a prescription of how to go about improving. So I'm going to turn it back over to Michelle for a quick, quick water break and uh, we'll take it from there. Great. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, as he said, you know, this is a great time to take a quick water break. Um, we want to ask if you would like a copy of Mark's book, How Fit Is Your Business or Fit to Grow. And we ask that if you request this book, you do it in exchange for a brief conversation about your digital marketing uh, with Surefire. So you can either choose Tuesday and Thursday of next week. Uh, the poll is now open for you to pick a time. If neither of those dates work for you, no worries. Just select, please email me to pick a time and we will help pick out a best time that works for you. And if you're already a current customer of ours, you can reach out to your coach and they will be they will be able to help you out further if you have any other questions. So take a second here to select a day and then we will get on with the fitness quiz. And the nice thing about this fitness quiz, you don't even have to break a sweat. <laughs> mm, that's right. No needles. Alrighty. And if you didn't get a chance to answer it during this time, we will be doing this again at the end. So stay tuned. All right, back to you, Mark. Also something that I failed to mention that this is being recorded. So if there's other members of your team that you think would benefit and you want to reach back to my friends here at Surefire, I'm sure in addition to uh, receiving a copy of one of the books, uh, you're also uh, welcome to uh, listen to the recording and that uh, they'll, they'll send out to you. So let me talk a little bit about this. You can see in this screenshot a couple different books and how did I really get into this you know here's this remodeling guy that you know it, that, that's focused on you know home improvement why did I get into this whole notion of business fitness and the reality is is that you know uh, most businesses don't really know what fitness is you know when it comes to your personal health you know I think we all for, as children we were told what to eat and not eat uh, we're bombarded by uh, all sorts of exercise opportunities that makes us more fit. We go to the doctor and get fitness checkups and blood checkups and all these blood tests and those kind of things. Uh, and we even go to the grocery store. And, you know, if you over, you look at most of the package type foods that you eat, they not only tell you kind of what's in it and the different kind of ingredients and the calories and those kind of things, but they also tell you what is the right amount that you should be eating. So, you know, what it's created is, I think, an environment that we just kind of understand. We may not be fit, personally, uh, but we kind of understand what it is. However, we haven't received that when it comes to our business. Uh, very, very few businesses in the remodeling industry went to Remodeling University. Why? Because it doesn't even exist. You know, uh, we certainly bumbled along and, and we've gotten a lot of scars and bruises on different things and we've kind of learned as we go. And what I've learned over the years is that, you know, of 10 different remodelers out there, there's really nine different business models. There's nine different ways to define success 
how to grow, as I talked about earlier. So it's created a level, I think, of confusion. So what we're going to do today is a little fitness checkup. So what I want you to do is just get out a piece of paper. And on this piece of paper, we're going to have 10, 1 through 10. I'm going to take you through a checkup of 10 criteria the ways to look at your business. Now, there's a few rules of the game of how we're going to do this. Number one is that when you're scoring yourself, score yourself 10 being the best and one being the worst. Now, if you're not sure whether you're a seven or eight, just go ahead and use 7.5. Number two, this is a very personal exercise. It's somewhat subjective. I'm not literally coming in and studying your balance sheet and P&L and doing a lot of those things. I'm allowing you to kind of self-judge yourself. So understand it's subjective, it's very personal. So you wanna be very honest with yourself in doing this. This is more also about looking at what you need to improve upon, not just your overall fitness score. And that'll make more sense when we get into the scoring towards the end. So there's 10 criteria that we're going to be talking about. Now, what I want you to do, I'm going to go through each one of these on this webinar, and I want you to not score yourself until I finish describing each one. And the reason is, is you need to understand kind of fully the criteria of each one. Now, it's not, I'm going to go through a series of questions, but what I want you to have is one score for each category. So knowing your numbers is the first one we'll talk about. Zero to 10, you might say, okay, I'm a good solid six, then score yourself a six. It's not the subcategories of the questions I'll be discussing with you. So with all that said, hopefully everybody has a pencil or a pen and a piece of paper and let's get started. So number one criteria I want to talk about is knowing your numbers. So here's a way to look at knowing your numbers. You know, is your business guided by the numbers? You know, do you really track them and is it guided by the numbers? How often do you look at the numbers? Look at your, your P&Ls. How often do you look at your lead numbers, your sales numbers? How often do you really track those key numbers? You know, do you have a dashboard with specific metrics such as maybe cost per lead you know a dashboard is kind of like a car's dash now you have a speedometer you have a, a fuel gauge and you have a temperature gauge and most people as they're driving along they'll look at the speedometer you know maybe every five minutes or so they'll look at the fuel gauge maybe every eight hours and then they'll look at the temperature gauge maybe every hour or so but the reality is that's a dashboard that you have to have with your business too do you have a solid budget and do you track it or does it sit on a shelf and kind of be memorialized? Uh, do you know your numbers from previous years? And one of the better companies out there always track not only this year's numbers, but they take a look at historical numbers. They understand kind of the difference in terms of key metrics in different times of the year in previous years. And then the last way to, I think, know your numbers is are your actual and estimated costs within 5%? One of the key elements, I think, for a more healthy business is predicting accurately when it comes to estimated costs. So score your business, 10 being the highest, 1 being the no lowest on knowing your numbers. Okay, number two criteria to look at is your systems and your process. And again, don't score yourself yet until I go through each one of these little sub bullets. One is, are your key processes written down? For example, lead management, sales process, production process. Uh, your processes aren't dependent on individual personalities. You know, they're more based on what creates the best results, best results in terms of profitability or clients or quality of work. Do you have a consistent team evaluation process? Do you have a feedback mechanism from clients and a process to be able to create surveys and feedback from clients? And then lastly, do you have different kinds of communication vehicles? Communication could be meetings, they could be uh, employee communication, client communication, it could be newsletters, could be different kind of communications. That's part of a process to have everybody kind of singing off the same uh, music as well. So score your business based on systems and processes, 10 being the highest and one being the lowest. Number three is leadership. Now in this case, the leadership is leadership. It's not just the owner. It's not just the president. It's not just the leader. Whatever the leadership is, bigger businesses have leadership teams. Smaller businesses might have a sole proprietor owner and that person is the leader. So here's a way to think about the leadership as it comes to criteria. 
Number one is the leadership kind of looking out and somewhat visionary. Do, do they have good communication skills? Is there a goal orientation to the leadership? Is there a strong leadership structure in place? Is there a clear sense of purpose? You know, we talk about this in terms of mission statement and the clear sense of purpose in terms of the vision. Is there strategic thinking? Is the leadership well-respected by different members of the team, but also well-respected in the business community? And do you think the leadership really walks their talk or do they live above, I think, the rest of the rank and file in the team member? So score your business 10 being the highest when it comes to leadership and one being the lowest. Number four is your team. Now, before you put a 10 down for your team, because everybody raises their hands when I'm doing this with audiences, says, oh, we have a great, great team. Everybody can have a great team. So let me at least give you some ways to think about uh, fitness of a team. Number one, you need strong performers. Do you have strong performers? Number two way to think about the team is their high retention rate. Is there good synergy between individuals and also departments? Do they want to grow with you? When's the last time some of the key team members have said, where am I going to be with you, Jim or Mary, five years from now or three years from now? Is there a gung-ho attitude and team spirit? Is there consistently exceeding expectations or consistently falling short? Is there a commitment on the individual team members to improve themselves, whether it's taking courses, reading books, seminars, webinars, different kind of things to improve themselves? And also, do you see the right level of accountability at different levels, whether it's leadership, whether it's management, or whether it's actually you know, in the field or in design and sales? So when it comes to your team, based on this criteria, just give yourself one score, 10 being the highest and one being the lowest. Number five is your product. Now, in this case, your product is obviously what you do for clients. However, it's not just sticks and bricks. So again, wait till I finish with the criteria before you score yourself. So the first thing I would say is that high quality advice design and service. Is your product well-defined? You know, this is a challenge with a lot of businesses is they don't have a very well-defined product. I remember years ago doing a seminar. I said, what's the right size? What's the right pri uh, dollar size project for your business? And the, the individual up front said it's somewhere between 5000 and 800000 I then asked someone in the back of the room who I know, Jim Strite, had a very successful fit business. What is the right size project for your business and he said seventy two thousand four hundred and fifty dollars you know he was very targeted like a bullseye on the right size very well defined project consistent client experience is a way to i think determine the product on time delivery or are you constantly making excuses or seeing the time slip a clear demographic of who your client is does your product respond to diverse economic conditions you know this is important but you know if it doesn't then you better be out there kind of making hay today because we're going to see some slippage and going to see some backing off that you'll need to get through those times and also is your product predictable i'm more impressed with the, with business that predict the product and deliver it than i'm necessarily impressed with overly high or low quality uh, uh variants so score your business, 10 being the highest and one being the lowest on the product. Number six is your profitability. Now with many people, this is what they think it's all about with fit businesses, but that's not really true. You know, profitability is a product of many, many things. It's a result. However, you can look at profitability and if a business is not profitable, obviously it's not good either. So therefore, you know, Let's look at profitability. Is it as you predicted it to be? And I say as you predicted because sometimes you're investing in the business in different ways and it's that profit that you're investing back that makes you, this year's profits a little bit less. Are, is your profitability in balance, short and long term? In other words, are you positioning yourself today, not only for 2018 good results, but also 2019? Do you feel like your cash flow is under control? Are you seeing consistent year-to-year -year improvement with your profitability? And are your different ratios that you study within your business strong? So when it comes to profitability, rate yourself 10 being the highest and 1 being the lowest. Okay, number seven, we're in our final leg here on the fitness checkup, and then I'll summarize with what all these scores mean, uh, is the stress. Now, in this case, the scoring of, the, of this is a little bit tricky. You want the right level of stress, not high stress or low stress. 
So a 10 would be the right level of stress. And I do believe that, you know, I used in this analogy or metaphor in my book, you know, businesses are like a rubber band. You know, when they're limp, it doesn't do you any good. When they're, they're snapped, it doesn't do you any good. So stress is like the right level of tension in a rubber band or in a business. So here's a way to look at it. That you make time for your friends and your family. That you're able, and the key word is able, to you know work a reasonable amount of hours to do what you need to do. Do you feel like you have control of your day or does your day control you? Is your proactive time in check or are you spending a lot of time putting out fires and reacting and that's in the business? Do you spend some time working on the business, as Michael Gerber talked about, not just in the business? And then lastly is, do you and does the business in general make time for improving itself? So again, what's the right level of stress is a 10 and the highest score and not necessarily the most stress. So score your business in terms of level of stress. Number eight is your reputation. Now, in this case, again, most people that would be listening to a webinar like this, the reputation is relatively strong. But what I'd like you to do is just think about it in this way. Do you think the business is well respected in the industry and the market? Do you have raving fans for clients? Are you easily able to hire employees or is that just very tough because your reputation? Do you have a decent or high referral rate? Here's another one that's a little tricky and that is, do you find the media has an interest in what you do and how you do it? And then lastly, do the vendors kind of seek you out? You know, do those suppliers, do those distributors seek you out? So score your business in terms of reputation, 10 being the highest and one being the lowest. So we have two more to go. And these again are a little bit different than maybe many people have thought about, but one is how well positioned are you for the future? As I look at the better businesses out there, they're not just doing okay today, but they're really setting themselves up for 2019 and 2020. So how do you get positioned? You have to be stable and consistent. You have to have a pretty good ear to the ground and strong market awareness. You have to be capitalized then fairly well. Uh, you have to have a healthy bottom line because that bottom line obviously feeds the potential positioning in the future. You know, to be positioned, you need a plan. You need a business plan or a marketing plan. You also have to, I think, in some businesses, have a little bit of diversification for risk management. And then you also have to be investing in technology. Technology, as I said before, has a huge amount to do with your success in the future. And are you investing in it? And also, don't forget about the up and coming and mentoring those leaders for the future. So number nine, score yourself in terms of how well positioned you are. Ten being your position extremely well. And one, you're not well positioned at all. Okay. The last one is your alliances and relationships. As I said, you're not out there on an island by yourself. This is a team sport today. So I think one of the elements I like to look at is do you have a lot of established alliances with other professionals, whether they're manufacturers, distributors, trade contractors, or even other service businesses in marketing and legal and, and certainly in accounting? Do you have good dialogue and regular communication? You know, it's one thing to say you have these relationships, but if you don't ever get together and have good dialogue, it's not really something that's quite not very meaningful. Are you always seeking out synergistic opportunities with this? You know, we're in kind of a time that there's a tremendous amount of synergies and opportunities. And if you're really doing a lot of that, great. If you're not doing a lot of that, then, then you should be thinking about that moving forward. So score yourself and your business in terms of your alliances and your relationships moving forward. So what I want you to do is simply just add up all these scores. So add up all these scores real quickly here, knowing your numbers, processes, leadership, team, product, profitability, stress, reputation, and they're gonna give a total score. And I'm gonna give you just some guidelines in terms of what, the, what that score ultimately ends up meaning. Now, what's important, and I said this before, that your total score is less important since this is somewhat subjective, and it's more important that it allows you to know where your weak links are and what you need to focus on. But it also, when you have team members taking this fitness checkup, it creates an opportunity for dialogue and alignment. You know, successful businesses have great alignment. And if your scores are all over the place, 
then chances are you need to get a little bit more aligned so you're rowing together. So if your score is 85 or above, keep doing what you're doing. It's like going to the doctor, just come back next year for a checkup. If your scores are 75 to 84, you're fine, but focus on the scores that are below five. Now, I oftentimes use the example like, like uh, uh, students, and when your child comes home and they've got three A's, a B, and a D, you know which one to get a tutor on, the D. So if you have one or two or three scores that are below five, then you really need to put some attention. That's the one you need to focus on. And this is counterintuitive for most. If your scores are 65 to 74, then you're doing okay. You're, you're average. But you know, really put your ego aside. Maybe finding a mentor or a coach that can help you to become more successful. If your scores are 65 to 64, now it's time to say, okay, it's getting a little bit in the danger zone. It's kind of like the doctor saying your cholesterol's kind of creeping up. So you may want to start to step up that exercise before I have to medicate. So you need a plan. You need to monitor that plan on a monthly basis. If your scores are lower than this, say 45 to 54, now it's really time to bring your team together and really determine, you know, are my scores really accurate? You know, am I giving myself some false positives here? Because that might be the case with a subjective kind of survey or scoring system. If your scores are 35 to 44 now, I think you're getting into a little bit more trouble. And I would argue that that's a little risky. It may be time to really seriously think about, you know, testing and looking at yourself more carefully and really kind of going and, and finding some professional help, whether it's with your attorney or your accountant, because you're getting into a serious, really danger zone. And then lastly, if your scores are 35 or below, you know, it might be time for looking for another business to go work for. And I know a lot of people chuckle when I say that, but the reality is there's nothing wrong with you saying, you know, I love doing the sales or I love doing the production or I love doing kind of the, the financial end of the business. And that doesn't mean you're going to be good at everything else. So it might be a good time with really low scores like this to say, okay, maybe there's another opportunity that would be good for me and certainly good for my family out there. So I want to just take a minute and just touch on some frequently asked questions that are out there. And then I'll turn it over with to Michelle and we might have a minute or two to talk about any questions you might have, but you can always get in touch with me if you have a particular question. If you want to email it to either Surefire or myself, I'll be glad to try to help. So what if my scores are different than my partners or my coworkers? Well, that's again a great discussion point. What I usually do when I'm doing this with leadership teams, I put all the scores up. And then uh, what oftentimes happens is there's a reason that the scores are different. And it's not because you disagree. It's they're looking at this element of the business just differently than each other. So it's a great discussion point if they are different but it's not that unusual. Are all the criteria equally weighted? Well, in my scoring system, they are equally weighted. However, when I'm working with certain companies, what I try to do is look at the weighting a little bit more. For example, I would argue maybe leadership within the businesses. In many cases for certain businesses, especially fast growing businesses, might be a little bit higher weighting than some of the others. But they are equally weighted, but you don't necessarily have to look at it that way. How often should I take this business fitness checkup? I would recommend is that if your scores are real low, you might want to revisit it in three to six months. If your scores are average or above, just make a point to save your scores and do it like on an annual basis. And what I will say is they will change. I experienced this kind of change even within my own team. And I saw the scores from one year to the next drop down about four or five points. So they will change depending on certainly the environment and what's happening within your business. Should I retain a coach to help me? Well, I'm a big believer that we all need a coach. I mean, if you consider yourself professional, like a professional athlete, what professional athlete doesn't have a coach or a mentor to help them? You know, it could be a family member that's your coach. It could be a business coach. It could be a lot of different folks that are out there. So the answer to the question is yes. I think having a coach, having advisors are certainly a good thing for you to do. How fit are other companies? Well, I created this fitness scoring system based on the fitness of other companies. And there, this has had literally thousands of different businesses that attest. And the best of the best have very high scores and the very weak companies have very low scores. 
So the answer is the scores are all over the place. So you, if you do want to compare yourself to others and have other companies take the fitness checkup, especially the ones that are the great ones, take it for them for that matter and, and see how they, they measure up to you. How do I conduct this with other team members? Well, as I said before, you can actually contact your friends here at Surefire. They'll actually let you do a, uh, get you a copy of the recording uh, with this recording. Do it as a really, you know, a structured way. You know, do it in a way that you're doing it all together and do it in a serious way. If you do this in a haphazard way, you're not going to see very good results, Or, but it's much more of a team exercise to do it together. And then as a leader, it's a good thing to do to discuss these scores together. How do I get more information on this topic? Well, needless to say, there's just a tremendous amount. You can certainly read one of my books, my How Fit Is Your Business, takes you to not only through the fitness checkup, but takes you through a lot more stories and case studies and a lot more uh, of the prescription of how to improve the business. So in addition to everything else, as I said, you can get copies of my book, How Fit Is Your Business or Fit to Grow, just by contacting your friends here at Surefire. But also, Surefire does, and we do a a podcast series together. And I would encourage not just uh, listening to one of the podcasts, but I, what I would encourage is that you actually subscribe to the podcast so it automatically comes. Some of the different topics, change or become irrelevant, the future of remodeling, how to deal with a cash crunch, half time, you know, going into the locker room this time of the year. What do you do? Innovation, defining success. What is the ideal team? and then certainly talking money. So there's many, many more topics that you can get into, but I would encourage you to you know, really subscribe to it and then you'll get these regular topics every two to four weeks and then you can make it part of your learning curve if you want to take your business to the next level. So I want to quickly turn it over to uh, Michelle and, and she'll uh, wrap it up. And again, I want to thank everybody for listening today. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, so while we wrap up things here, I want to ask again, if you would like a copy of Mark, one of Mark's books, Help Fit Is Your Business or Help Fit To Grow, uh, we ask that if you request this book, you do an ex and it, it's an exchange for a brief conversation um, about your digital marketing uh, with Surefire. So like I said earlier, it's on Tuesday and Thursday of next week, but if those days do not work for you, um, you can select just please email me to pick a time um, and we will help pick out a time that works best for you. So the poll is now open. Please select uh, a day and then we will get on to the exciting thing of the Google Home Mini. And also when you hop on a call with one of our digital marketing experts, this is an awesome opportunity for you to see how partnering with a digital marketing company can make a huge improvement in your marketing efforts. And Trish Burkhart says, thank you, Mark. Very nice. Thank you, <laughs> Trish. All righty. Thank you, everyone, for answering the poll. So. Today's lucky recipient of the Google Home Mini is Taylor Williams. Congratulations, Taylor. Please email marketing at surefirelocal.com with your full mailing address and we will ship that right out to you. A huge thank you to Mark again and to all of you for taking the time out of your day to join us. We hope you learned something new and we look forward to seeing you on future webinars. You can check those out at the link at the top of our homepage. Also, please take a minute to fill out the survey at the end and let us know how we did today and what topics you would like to hear about in the future. We love checking those out um, when we plan our webinar schedule. Thank you and have a wonderful day.